thank you all for being here. This is not normal for me to stand in front of the podium the entire time, but we are recording this. For those of us who could not join us, I'll be posting this on my YouTube channel. Once I figure out how to do that, it will be up there. So I'm going to be drafting some students tomorrow to help me out with that. Luckily, our media crew here at the school is just fantastic. And Louise Miller, she's hiding right now. She's the one that's taking care of the recording for us. So thank you, Louise, very much for being here. So thank you all for being here. Uh, this topic has been one that we've been working towards for a better part of two years for implementation next year here at the high school. So our plan today is just a brief jaunt through the key components of block scheduling here at the high school. All right, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nolan Garrenser. I am the principal here at the high school. I'm going to be the principal here at the high school. And I'm very, very hopeful and very, very excited about what's coming with block scheduling. Now, I know that this is a new thing here at Penn Argyle. It is not a new thing the Lehigh Valley, the state, or nationwide. Block scheduling has been around a long time. But we hope to answer the question tonight is, why block scheduling and why now? And we're going to give you a lot of answers to those questions as to the benefits of block scheduling here at the high school. Because that's the number one goal. How is this going to benefit the students here at the high school? And myself and this is Mr. Greg Freeman. He is the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for 7th to 12th grade. He and I will be traded back and forth throughout this presentation. Now, there will be a spot at the end for questions. If there is a burning question in you, though, and you think you're going to forget it, please do not hesitate to raise your hand as we're going through the presentation. All right? However, at the end, we will take the time for all the questions you may have. Students, parents, family members, friends, community members. This is the spot for that, okay? So, are there any questions before we begin? So, I talk fast. Uh, I was talk to all of you as I talked to my previous classes. If I am talking too fast, it's because I'm getting excited. It's not offensive to yell out, slow down, but I've gotten better with that as I've gotten older. So, without much ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Freeman to get us started here. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it and think that it's going to really help uh, in terms of you guys understanding why we're doing this, as Mr. Garrett said. So, click on Mr. Garrett. Oh, I did. That right there. There we go. So, uh, most fundamentally, why, why are we doing this? Why did we decide to, to move in this direction? Uh, and the way I explain this is that, you know, for Almost every reason it's the small size of our district that is an asset that is the benefit of, of going here, of raising a family here, um, and you know it's the best school district around. And in relation to uh, changes that come, whether it's imposed by the state, whether it's COVID and the consequences of that, whether it's any kind of initiative that we feel is best for student learning and student outcomes, we sometimes find that our, our small size uh, can be tricky when we're trying to you know, engage in new initiatives. A lot of times uh, I say that you know, if we want to add, we have to subtract. In other words, if we want to you know, embark down a new path, have a new class, have a new intervention, usually that involves removing something. And replacing it. Uh, and so, very simply, why are we moving to block? Because given our size, it offers tremendous flexibility and capacity going forward for us. It's going to allow, most importantly, for uh, with relation to students, more choices. More choices about what classes they can take, when they can take them, what order they can take them, and more opportunities consequently. So we'll talk a little bit about career pathing um, and some other things related to that. It's going to be great for students who want to explore their passions and not just uh, knock off, check off the boxes as far as graduation requirements. And it's also very, very importantly going to allow us room and flexibility to provide academic supports for those who need them and enrichment. All right, so 
what is instruction going to look like? I think there's a lot of uh, myths or rumors about what it's going to be like to be in a block classroom. And Mr. Garrister is going to go over the structure. He's going to tell you how many minutes an instructional period will be, but suffice it to say that it is more minutes than uh, students have in one academic period at present. But that is, again, an opportunity. So our teachers don't use that time, and they don't use it now to do this, they don't use that time to lecture, to talk at students. It's gonna allow for more time in group work, it's gonna allow for more time in labs and our science classes, it's gonna allow for more cooperative learning in general. And what that means is simply that, again, not teachers talking at students, but students having various opportunities to engage with the content um, in ways that are going to help them retain it and understand it. Again, it does not look like, under any circumstances, a teacher talking at students for the, the duration of a period. And I have to say, being in classrooms weekly, Mr. Garrenser as well, we can both attest to the fact that I have not yet seen a teacher, even now, in our 43 minute uh, class periods, talk at students for the duration of a period. Because for many years now, it's been uh, very, uh, very widely accepted and adopted that that is not the appropriate way to reach kids. Okay, you might have a portion of your instructional period involved in lecturing, what we would call lecturing, but it is rarely, if ever, the entirety of a period. This certainly will not be uh, in the block form. All right, some specific details. With Block, and Mr. Garrenser is going to review the credit requirements overall, but with the change to Block, we currently require three science and math credits for graduation. We are going to increase those requirements to four. Now, we look at this as setting students up with more opportunities, not more requirements, because not only, yes, will it allow us to align ourselves with the broader Lehigh Valley and better prepare our students for life after high school, regardless of college or a career, but uh, it's going to offer more choice. So in the area of science, you can see we're writing a number of new courses to help students satisfy that, uh, that increased requirement. Introduction to healthcare science. This is going to help uh, pique students' interest in the healthcare field. Perhaps set them on a path to CIT where they have a healthcare science program or pursue pre med at, in a college setting. Forensics. We surveyed the students, and forensics was our most uh, widely anticipated uh, new elective by the students. Zoology, astronomy, and environmental. So, plenty of new opportunities in addition to the electives that already exist in uh, science. In math, again, it would be unfair to increase the requirements and not ensure that students at every level, those that don't like math and those that do, have opportunities to take a course that actually meets their needs um, and engages them. So we're going to have a financial math class. This is going to be sort of a practical math class for students that really don't need you know, pre-calculus or calculus or want to go down that route. It will help them whether they pursue a career after high school or go to college. We're going to have a, an Algebra 3 class, or a college algebra class, probably taken by a lot of students who will go to college, and we're finding that you know another course after Algebra 2 that stresses those algebra skills um, is needed because students are entering college and still having difficulty in those lower level math classes. And then for our AP students, we're going to have what is essentially the second part of Calculus 1, it's known as Calculus BC. So again, the point is a class for every ability level and interest. We're writing a research class. This will be a class that is taught by our librarian, Mrs. Cipriano. She, uses, she can use the curriculum to push in to other teachers' courses or to have as a standalone class. We're going to have a character education class. So those of you who are already in the high school, know what our character ed program is about. Those of you who are in eighth grade and coming up, you're going to get all the information you can handle very soon when uh, Mr. Garrenser does his uh, eighth grade parent. Uh, but that class is going to help acclimate 
incoming freshmen to the culture of the high school, to the, the, our character education program, and stress executive skills, study skills. Um, and then finally, we're gonna add an AP World History course that can be taken if you're a junior instead of our World Cultures course. So the point here is more choices, more courses, more opportunities at every ability level. All right, specifically about AP courses. So one of the uh, things that I know a lot of parents are wondering and students uh, is, you know, in a block format, you typically have semester, meaning half year courses. And as an AP student, you might ask yourself, well, what if I take my, you know, AP psychology, my, my AP math course uh, in the fall, it ends in January, and the uh, AP test is in until May. There's a huge gap there between the class and the test. What we are going to do, this is something that uh, we listened to feedback from a lot of stakeholders, and we're gonna be the only school that I know of to, to do this, is we are going to hold our AP classes for three quarters of the school year. All right, they're gonna start in August, and they're gonna go through the third marking period. So that will significantly lessen that gap between the end of the course and the test. There will be one or two uh, AP courses still offered in a semester format, but only uh, after listening to the feedback of teachers that uh, believe doing so will actually be uh, more than conducive to, to students performing well on the tests. Uh, as I already mentioned, we have a lot of college prep electives being written and going into place. So students at that level are gonna have more than enough choices in whatever content area they, they're interested in. And then in the area of remediation, uh, for the first time, we're going to offer a what's called biology foundations course. So as many of you probably know, our state, like all states, has our standardized tests and students passing them is uh, one of the pathways now to graduation. And so we want to make sure that we set our students up for success. And if students don't pass those, what, what are at the high school known as keystone exams, that we give them opportunities for remediation. In biology, we're going to offer this for the first time. We have one for math. Um, so we're very excited about that. Also, students who come up here and are, you know, a little weaker in their math skills. We have a, uh, we have two classes that split algebra into two parts. Right now, they're called Algebra A and B, and right now, a student on that track would take two years to complete basically what is algebra. Algebra A, their freshman year, Algebra B, their sophomore year, and then taking the keystone that spring. Under block, they're not gonna have any gaps between those courses, so currently there's a summer gap, which we know learning loss occurs in the summers. They're going to have Algebra A and B within a school year, test at the end of the year, and that lack of any gap, just like I mentioned about AP testing, is going to, we think, result in better scores, especially for retesters. Um, and then this will also be a little bit more uh, expanded upon by Mr. Garrison, but you will see that students who fail courses um, will have opportunities to retake up to three opportunities to retake their failed course during the school year. That is key because right now that there are very few opportunities for a student who fails courses to retake them during a school year and still graduate on time. Usually a student has to take a credit recovery program in the summer. Not so in block, they have up to three opportunities to retake a course and graduate on I mentioned career pathways earlier. So career pathways exist in many high schools in the Lehigh Valley, and the idea here is pretty simple. We don't necessarily think a student should know what career they want to pursue when they come into high school, or even when they graduate, but you may, as a student, have a particular interest in a content area, an overall career pathway, meaning a set of skills, and a broad interest that'll put you on a certain track maybe to get a certain degree in college, maybe to go to CIT for a certain program to study. And in block, because of the expanded ability to choose your courses and the order you take them, you're gonna be able to set yourself on a career pathway 
much more easily than under the current uh, system. Mr. Karen, sir. All right. Oh, don't, don't go there yet. All right. Oh, Mr. Freeman jumped the gun on that one here, so I had to preface this a little bit. So when I talked driver's ed, basically I said, I'm going to overwhelm you, and then we're going to break it down and make it seem not so overwhelming. So what I'm going to show you next is the schedule for block for next year, okay? It may be a bit overwhelming at first. When we break it down, you'll see it's nowhere near as confusing as it looks or as detrimental as it looks. Some people see the 80 minutes and say, oh my goodness, all right? Then we'll talk about it. So here's the schedule. Okay, it's divided up basically over our three lunches. Lunch A, lunch B, lunch C. Four 80-minute blocks. That's where you see the differences between a lot of school districts. You'll see 90-minute blocks, you'll see 70-minute blocks, 75, what have you. We have focused on 80 as being a time for our blocks. Now, you heard Mr. Freeman say, this is the biggest spot of consternation for many as we approach block is oh my goodness I'm going to be in this class that I'm not a big fan of for 80 minutes <laughs> for me that was any type of math class I was worried about it. however what you find out is that what Mr. Freeman said this is not 80 minutes of straight lecture and for a poor math student like myself that 80 minutes was vital to me understanding math because not only did we learn something new, that gave my math teacher more time to work with students like me to make sure I understood the topic that day, and the next day I was ready to move on. Okay, this extra time provides a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher, a lot of enrichment, a lot of remediation. Don't think for one second that teachers are saying, wow, I have 80 minutes, I'm going to cram three days worth of lessons into one. That's not what block is about. And for two years, teachers have been working on getting their heads around the perfect format for their course for block. And that's a vital part of this. This has been in play for two years. We have a board of education that is very open, thinks critically about what's best for the students at Penn Argyle, and allow Mr. Freeman, Mr. Schlegel, our teachers and others to work through this for two years. It's not something that was thought up on a Monday, planned out on a Tuesday, and implemented on a Wednesday. This has been a long, thorough process where no stern stone has been left unturned. And this schedule reflects that. So we still have 10 minutes in the morning for announcements. Day still starts at 7.30. Block one and block two. Those are your 80-minute blocks. Now, block three is where things can sometimes get a little confusing. But be not troubled. This is very, very simple. If you have first lunch, you'll have block one, block two, a 30-minute lunch, then block three and block four. If you have lunch B, your block three is split into two. You have part one of block three, then lunch, and then part two of block three. There are some people who think, I don't want that one. But that lunch in the middle sometimes is very, very conducive to certain courses that you have around that time. And teachers that get a class separated by a lunch, you'll find that they think of very creative ways to kind of bridge that gap over that lunch period. Last lunch or lunch C, you have one, two, three, and then your lunch, and then block four. Right? Those are the three types of lunch. Now, what that means is something I cannot wait to see put in place. How many of you are in eighth grade here right now? Excellent. This goes out to all of you. Used to be because of scheduling purposes that all freshmen ate lunch together in last lunch. It's kind of counterproductive when we say you're part of the high school and here's your own lunch just for you guys. Now what we're going to have, because of block scheduling, these lunches are going to be mixed based on schedules. You will have freshmen with seniors. You'll have freshmen with sophomores and juniors spread throughout. I can see a lot of looks of excitement there in the middle of the auditorium. Absolutely. All right? 
Think of this as a positive thing. Our seniors and our juniors, especially our upperclassmen and women, have come to me throughout the year asking for more opportunities for reaching out to the freshman class from the get-go. Say so we can welcome them into the high school community right away. Eating lunch together is a lot is a good step towards that goal. All right, so right away from day one, these lunches will be mixed. You'll see green and white block at the end of the day. I will explain that in a bit. But green and white block is our new revamped activity period. Activity period, as of this year, is no more. Green and white block will take its place. Mr. Sampson up here, I give him full credit. That was his name for, for, that, for that block, so give him a lot of credit for that. I'll talk about that. That's the schedule. All right, four 80-minute blocks, 30-minute lunch, five minutes of transition in between classes. Right now we're at four. That five minutes takes into account that, hey, you're going to be in a class for 80 minutes. The teacher's going to work in breaks throughout that 80 minutes where you're not sitting at your desk, you're getting up and moving, you're doing group work, you're doing a presentation, something like that. But that extra minute in between classes goes a long way. Even though we're adding a minute to transitions, we have half as many transitions throughout the day. Less time in the hallways, less time for any type of things in the hallways that should be ha not happening in the hallways. All right, Less transitions, more time in class. So, courses and credits. I'm sorry, I have to, get, I have to walk around a little bit, so I'll take this with me. So you'll see at the end, the class of 2027, those of you that, you're, that are here, you will have 29 credits necessary to graduate. It's 23 right now. Do not think of that as, oh my goodness gracious. All right, we have given you an entire, a large amount of time for new electives. Mr. Freeman went over them. Electives in science, in math, not to mention the number of electives we already have in business education, English and social studies. So often we have students that cannot take all those electives. Now with block, you'll have more time, more space to do that. Now we're not just going to throw our juniors, sophomores, and current freshmen into the mix and say, you have 29 credits. We're going to grandfather them in eventually. But the class of 2027, by the time you are seniors, and it's a beautiful May day at Alumni Field, you will have completed 29 credits. All right, that's a very big deal for us because we want to make sure you can take advantage of these courses that we are offering. Now, we talked about if students fail the course or courses. So often we have a freshman who comes in and maybe does poorly in one or two classes and now they're playing catch up their entire four years. Block scheduling stops that from happening and allows us to work in course makeups throughout the year, giving them a better chance to graduate when they are supposed to. It negates the necessity for summer school. You can take it during the year. But you may be thinking, okay, well what about me? I don't plan on failing anything. I work really, really hard. What's going to happen to me? Senior year, if you're on pace with credits, you'll have three open slots in your schedule. Now every student is going to have at least two blocks every semester here at Penn Argyle. Most will have four until you're a senior. If you have two a semester, you're probably a CIT student. But when you get to senior year, you will have some openings. There's rewards for that. One of them is senior block excusal. Seniors who have met all of their credits, who are not, do, do not have spotty discipline records and do not have unexcused absences, will be eligible for senior block excusal. That means once a semester your senior year, you can have block one or block four excusal. If you have block one excusal, you can come in late for second block. So you can sleep in. If you're like me and you don't sleep in, you can have block four excusal. 
That means after third block, you can go home. All right? There's a lot of options there for seniors. Some seniors might want to take that in the morning because they have an after-school band, chorus, or an athletic event. They don't want to leave just to come back. So they'll take the morning block excusal. Others might be ready to go for a job after school. And now if they can leave early, they can start that job sooner, be home sooner, and do any homework or enjoy themselves as they see fit. That is a reward for the seniors who keep up on their credits. It's also a reward for those freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who might have failed the class but made it up before their senior year. And now they're on pace to graduate. Now, just because we have blocked excusal does not mean every senior takes it. It's an option. There are a lot of seniors who will say, you know what, I have an extra spot now. I want to take that science or math elective I didn't have room for before because I plan on going to college for something in STEM. Or I'm going to be a nursing major. I want to take all the sciences I can. They can do that. They can take a dual enrollment course at one of our local universities. If they take it virtually, they can have a spot here to do that during that period. Or they might think, you know what, this doesn't fit in my schedule, but I want to take another elective or another penarchal course. They can take it virtually during that time. So seniors, there are a lot of privileges for you if you are up to date on your credits, all right, during that time. So block excusal, again, I mentioned some of this already. You have to have a minimum number of credits. You have to have a minimal number of unexcused absences and discipline referrals. Yes, you can lose it. It is a privilege. Seniors that are failing courses, that are discipline problems, that are getting mounted unexcused absences, senior excusal will be taken away. It is a privilege that you earn and must continue to earn. Athletic eligibility for athletes out there, we are in line with PIAA and NCAA standards. You have to be passing 50% of your classes to be eligible for athletics here at Penn Argyle. So here's how it's going to be grandfathered in. So the class of 2024 will need 25 credits to be able to graduate. Remember, we're starting block next year. So you will have the space and the courses to be able to do this. And this does not mean that you need to take AP Calc BC. Because if I had to take that, I'd be quaking in my boots as of right now. You can take Intro to Health Sciences or Criminal ju Justice and book at that with Forensics or Zoology or Astronomy or Financial Math to get to those 25 credits. Class of 2025 will be 26 credits. Class of 2026, 27 and a half. And finally, for next year's freshmen, the class of 2027, that'll be the 29 credits to graduate. You can see we're working it in slowly, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to take the expanded electives as well as increase graduation credits. Here's the thing we are trying to avoid. Other districts that have block, some of their seniors don't step foot in the building. They have enough credits so early on that they don't have to come to school all or one semester of their senior year. They have an internship, they have dual enrollment. Here's the thing, we value our courses here so much. We understand how skilled and professional our faculty is that we want our seniors here senior year. They will still have those opportunities, but they will be here in Parnarjal Area High School throughout their senior year. That was an important step for all of us in planning this, making sure that from start to finish, they're in our hallways, they're in our classrooms, they're learning the new courses and the old courses that our faculty have written. That was an important goal for all of us. And the CIT credits as well, those students who are interested in CIT, we're upping science and math by a credit from three to four. There are opportunities at CIT 
for CIT students to get that fourth math and science credit. So, green and white block. This is a little bit of a change for those of us that are currently here at the high school. Okay, green and white block is our new activity period. And activity period is something that a lot of students engage in. This is where <coughs> students go to band, they go to chorus, perhaps they're a class officer, maybe they're a mini-thon, what have you. Those opportunities are still going to remain. However, with the extra push towards more time in academics, green and white block is being revamped, activity period is being revamped in the green and white block. We're still on a six day cycle, as you can see, A through F. But most of the time, we're gonna engage in what's called block return, all right? For days A, B, C, and D, during green and white block, most students will return to the block assigned to that day. A is block one. So at the end of the day, block one, at the end of the day and A day, you'll go to block one. B day, block two. C day, block three. D day, block four. E and F day will alternate by marking period. Marking period one and three, E and F day will be block one and block three return. Second and fourth marking period, block two and block four return. Now, you're thinking, well, I've been, I've course. I'm, I'm an athlete and I, I'm on the golf team and almost every day in September, I'm out early. There is no new instruction during green and white block. It's simply an enrichment period, a remediation period. Let's say you're a student that was out yesterday, you missed the math exam. Now you can, you can make it up during green and white block instead of taking time out of that block during the day. Because we all know what happens. You miss Monday, you make up your test on Tuesday, now you're two days behind. Now you can stay in class, make up the exam later. Let's say, I'll use math again, not to, this is always my subject. I need help in math. Green and white block is there for remediation. And you return to that class. You're with your teacher, you're with your peers. Now, teachers know that they should not expect all of their students to return because quite possibly those students could be at band, at chorus, they could be in student government, they could be in class officer meetings or mini-thon. Those supplementals will still exist during green and white block. And they'll exist when that advisor has a free period. That's when those meetings will take place. So band, chorus, and orchestra, jazz band, chamber singers will still happen during green and white block. All right. We're also using it for class meetings, assemblies, resource period, what have you. It is a wholly academic period. Now, you may be thinking, well, you know, I have flicker ball, and I love it. Or I have basketball during activity period, and I love it. Those opportunities can still exist because with block, there's the opportunity to take, it, to take more and more phys ed credits during your four years. So instead of taking an athletic event during activity for 30 minutes, you can enroll in another phys ed course or two and get an 80 minute block at that time. So that's green and white block. So timeline going forward, ladies and gentlemen. February, we are going to start the registration process. In fact, Mr. Freeman, myself, Mr. Sampson, and our faculty members of our block scheduling committee discussed this today. In February, we are going to start rolling out registration procedures. We have new and exciting ways to do this. To be able to ensure that all of the students know the new courses and know the registration process. It's going to go slow, methodical, so everyone understands. Most importantly, we don't want any of the students, this is all new, we don't want them feeling rushed when choosing classes. So we're very deliberate in the way we've planned that. April or May, we're going to have a mock block day or days. So if you're currently a high school student, probably over two days, looking like April now, but April or May, we'll lock that down. 
We're going to have a mock block day. One of those days, we'll do periods one through four in 80 minutes. Day two, we'll do blocks you know, five or six through nine in 80 minute blocks, just to get a feel for how those blocks are going to go. And finally, in August, students and parents are going to receive their block schedules, and we'll commence with block scheduling for the 23 24 school year. Our goal with registration that early in February is that we don't have a number of students who want to change their schedule in August. They'll know much earlier what their schedule is and it's one that they're happy with. So now that's our presentation. We'd like to open the floor to questions and we'll do this the old fashioned way of raising, if you want to raise your hand if you have a question and Mr. Freeman and I will do our best to answer it. We also have Mr. Sampson here in case we have to go to the bullpen uh, for an answer. And I will restate your question just so we can pick it up on the camera. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what about the eighth graders? Are they going to have a mock block time too? Or are they coming into this line in August having no mock block experience? It's on. It's on. Yeah, good question. So I will be, so Mr. Garris, you're obviously. Can you that question real quick, sorry. So good question. So what preparation will the current eighth graders have stepping into the block scheduling uh, for their ninth grade year? So um, Mr. Garrister mentioned a little bit about stepping back a little bit. The scheduling process and the course registration process up here, uh, I will be working with the middle school administration and counselors uh, to uh, have assemblies and tutorials uh, for the eighth graders throughout this spring to try to get them ready. Um, at present, we do not have plans for a mock block day for them. But the good news and the silver lining there is that uh, for, for those parents and students that are eighth graders now, you know you essentially actually do participate in a little bit of block scheduling right now. You have a reading and writing course, which is like a block. You also have two math courses, and that is like a math block. So you actually are better prepared for block scheduling than our high school students. Well, do you think that they could perhaps implement it at the middle school at the same timing that you guys are doing it up here and have the teachers at the middle school do the same kind of thing that you're doing here down there? They don't necessarily have to come here, but can the teachers at the middle school kind of run the same timeline to give the kids an idea of how long it is to sit in class for eight minutes, how they have to manage themselves with their personal stuff that they want to have to do, you know what I'm saying? Like, I do you think yeah. that that could be implemented at the same time that you guys do it here, down there? Yeah, definitely uh, can be taken under advisement, but as I said, we already have them essentially in blocks now, but yes. I have two questions. My first one is, so is there no junior waiver anymore? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question about junior waiver. The answer is there's not going to be junior waiver next year for a number of reasons. One, because green and white block is going to be an academic period meant for mediation, extended learning. It goes against my values to allow students, juniors, to leave for that when they can be getting academic work done and expanding their academics. The trade-off for that is any, any junior can now use that time to make sure they're in line for their senior year for block excusal, which to me is the bigger reward than waiver. Second question. Um, what, when does gym class like, go on? So two questions. So gym class, we're looking at right now, gym class will be taking most likely one of the credits during freshman year, but then with the expanded credits, you can take it your sophomore, junior, or senior year. You can take more than the required credits as well with gym. So really, the gym credits are going to fit in. You have a lot of autonomy and choice when you want that gym credit to fit in your so, schedule. So if I already took it my freshman and sophomore year, I don't want to take it again? That's a good question. And yes, we, that's the question I was asking for. If you already took your gym credits, are you good to go? And 
that's dancers, yes, because we have a lot of other electives we could fit in there to make up that other space that you might need. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so the faculty, what sort of feedback are you getting from them at this point? Like, are they overall like all on board, or are you getting like a lot of concerns, and are they being addressed? Like, I know for uh, when I was a junior in high school in Easton, we switched the block scheduling, and it always seems like half of our teachers were like right on board, and the other half just kind of, you know, got through it. So I'm just, how are you? Like, what efforts are being? done to make sure everyone's on the same page and being held accountable and that they're properly prepared for such a big change. Right. So two questions. Is, what's our faculty feedback about Buck? It's an excellent question. I'll start at step one. The best thing about this is that it started so early, two years ago. So this, this whole idea started, I was still a teacher. I was teaching social studies here up in A207. And so I was there right from the initial role as a teacher and I heard teacher feedback. And it's very similar to something you would expect when a big change comes down. There, there is some consternation, there is some fear, there is some apprehension for teachers that never taught in block before. If you've taught at Panarge your whole, your whole career, we have a lot of faculty who have, going from a 43 minute period to an 80 minute block is tremendous. But starting two years early, giving our faculty professional development and how to teach in block, strategies for blog. I would say that apprehension has dwindled to a minimum. I can't think of one faculty member, I'm saying this honestly, I cannot think of one faculty member that is against this. They are, at the very most, okay, I'm ready to go, I'm prepared, I just need to put my toe in the pool and get started. That's where we're at right now. They are ready, they feel good about it, the professional development has helped them, and everyone, the best thing about this faculty is that everyone understands why we're doing it, everyone sees the benefits in it, and everyone is on board to make it a success. So, there may be those who are like, okay, 80 minutes, here we go on day one, but they are so prepared and prepared early that they're ready to take up the challenge. And you're oh, like amicable to like, you know, making sure that if they are in opposition, that those voices are heard and addressed. Absolutely. It's like a very open, like, it's not just, this is how it is, here we go. It's yeah. flexible. You, it's a great question. We've taken feedback in for a year. We've had a block, well, for more than a year, we've had a block scheduling committee okay. of faculty members to bring concerns and questions to administration so we can address them. So basically over these two years, any consternation there was, issues, hang-ups, things like that, we've been able to iron out and everyone get on the same page. Those committee members have disseminated to the rest of the faculty. In fact, on Monday, a few days ago, we unveiled this very same presentation to the faculty. And every faculty member there knew much of it, it was explained to them, and were on board with it. And, and, and also, yes, Mr. Freeman held up visits to Catasauqua High School for these faculty members, anyone interested, to see how block works in real life. So they visited classrooms at Catasauqua High School to see it talk to students and talk to faculty members there about blog. And that alleviated a lot of concerns as well. And you know, one thing about this faculty being teammates, we have a large number that taught in blog. So a lot of those faculty members have kind of taken up the charge to talk to their, their peers as well about challenges they faced, how they overcame them, and the benefits of blog. That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Yes, sir. So, uh one of the things, I, I grasp that 80 minutes is a good opportunity to help people learn the subject matter more thoroughly. But uh, four blocks, two semesters is eight different subjects a year, but they currently run seven, so that's 14. So your exposure to various subjects would seem limited, not more opportunity, but less. So I'm not quite sure you only have uh, four blocks in a semester, and there's two semesters in a year that have eight different subjects, versus seven in a semester, and then there's 14 in a year. So it seems like you have more variety, maybe not as much depth, maybe you could go deeper in subsequent courses. So it, I, I guess I was just questioning the more opportunity with apparent less 
Okay, so the question is, does block statement truly offer more opportunity as opposed to periods? Is that, yeah. is that correct? So I want to make sure I'm paraphrasing that correctly. Mr. Sanders, you want to jump in there? Yeah, just, just, so, just so you're aware. Mr. Sanders, you can come to the microphone so that we can hear you on the recording. <laughs> Thank you. That is what happens. As a, as, a, as a person who's made the schedule around here for 20 years, just with, with the, when you're talking about the seven classes at a time, when you're in block, a half credit course, like here at Canardio, a half credit course now is half a year, meaning that you're in it for a semester, so you're in there basically for four months. When you're in a block system and you're taking a half credit course, it's only one marking period. So you'll have a greater opportunity to take even more electives. So electives that we teach now, like psychology, criminal justice, modern American history, along with some of the new classes that we're gonna be teaching, like zoology, forensic science, and astronomy, they're half credit courses, so they're gonna change every marking period. So a student that has maybe a semester, they're not only gonna take, they, they're not only gonna have the opportunity to take maybe one class period two, but they're gonna have two, they're gonna be able to take two classes, one marking period one, one marking period two, and then the second semester, another opportunity, marking periods three and four to do that. So in actually one block for the entire year, you can take four half credit courses. So it will offer more opportunities over the over the entire year than it would in a regular seven period day. You'd actually, in the four blocks, you'd have an opportunity actually to take up to 16 different classes. Now, English, math, history, and science are gonna be full credit courses that are gonna meet for both marking periods, but the rest of your schedule, you'll have the opportunity to take electives, and you can split every one of those blocks in half and take a half credit course. So there'd probably be up to 12 different classes that you could take if you were taking your four main courses and then four credits of electives, you'd have the opportunity to take eight different half credit courses. I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I have maybe two questions. Sure. So if you have pre calc, let's say in the fall for the two marking periods, are you able to move on to your next sequence of math or do you have to wait until the following year? The schedule is completely autonomous. Once we once you pass what we call our trigger courses for keystones, there's certain courses, Algebra 1, Biology, and English 10 that are our trigger courses for the keystone exams. Once you get through those, and for, again, depending on the track of the student, those are earlier or later, but then you can really tailor the schedule to your to fit your needs. If you finish your pre-calc, if there's courses available, and let's say you take pre-calc in the fall, in the spring, you can move on. That's why the, the amount of new electives is so important. So now if you knock those out early and you want to get to your Calc AB and your Calc BC, you can fit all of that in. And then my second question is, for sciences, is there going to be maybe an attempt to balance? If a kid wants to take multiple sciences in a year, you know, two or three, is there going to be an attempt not to have two sciences in that semester? Good question. Will it be an attempt to not to have two sciences in that semester? So, as the student becomes goes goes through the grades, becomes more of an upper class, and there's more opportunity to fit those electives in because again, the versatility. A lot of these electives are half credit, so there'll be a marking period. So they'll be able to fit those in. So if, one, if there's a conflict during one block, there may not be a conflict in another block. So it'll actually increase flexibility. So you can take all, all of those electives that you want. The whole goal here is to increase the amount of choice that you have and the space that you have. So if a student wants to run the gauntlet of all those science courses, they can take them and not have to differentiate between do I take this one or that one. They'll be able to fit that in throughout their four years. Will they be guided though on the balance? Because some kids will go too far and take too many. Will somebody be like, hey, let's try to put this in the spring and keep Absolutely, and the way that the, uh, the way that the schedule is going to be set up sometimes might be conducive for that. Also, our guidance department will be advising students as well as the teachers in that department. We're creating a program of studies. If you go to some websites, they have a program of study, course descriptions, prereqs, and all of that. That's going to be created over the next few months, and it'll actually map out what that department believes to be a good path for students going through their electives. So you'll have documentation of that as well as a guide as you plan your classes, which is another reason why our registration, we're taking it kind of slow so student and parent can kind of go over together 
and see what what would behoove them that coming year. In the back, yes, ma'am. Correct. So what you're taking in eighth grade right now will have an impact on what you take ninth grade year. Now freshman year in block, just like freshman year in periods, is somewhat already prescribed. As you advance through, there's more room for flexibility and variability through that. So what are your courses at now in eighth grade are? That will depend then what courses you're placed into based on prerequisites things of that nature in ninth grade. But your ninth grade year, a lot of that is gonna be prescribed for you. There will be some variances here or there based on what courses you're taking right now. But as you advance through the grades, you'll have more and more flexibility in what you take. <coughs> yes, ma'am. So last year when we picked our classes, we decided like what classes we wanted and then you guys made our schedule. Are we gonna be able to like make our own schedule? Let's say like I wanted to have math and science the first half of the year history and English the second half of the year, am I going to be able to decide like what classes I want to have with what each year? It's a good question. So I'll preface this. So she asked, am I going to be able to decide what classes I want and choose? That's always our hope. And let me preface this answer with a lot of it depends on availability, space, what grade you're in. Okay. However, our goal with scheduling is this. We're going to space it out. So one day, we're going to go over all the new courses go over a lot of the prereqs for different courses, and throughout that coming week, your teachers in those classes and in those departments will go over it as well. Then what we're going to do is probably have a class assembly, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, where that class will choose their courses on Skyward and also have a little hard copy that they'll pick as well. That'll be submitted to us, and our hope is always that we will keep your schedule that you picked as close to the one you picked in February as it is in August. That is our hope. We want you to get the schedule you want, but as classes fill up and space gets limited, we're going to ask you to make certain choices. You know, if you don't get choice one or choice two, maybe choice three and four will fit. Now, as you become a junior or a senior, it becomes a lot easier for you to get the choice that you want. Yes, ma'am. Some current CIT students have trouble picking classes currently that they would like available to them because of their limited half day here. How does block scheduling address that and what does the CIT student here at Pinardo, what does their schedule look like? So CIT student basically, it's very similar to what it is right now. AM CIT will be at CIT, probably eat lunch there, come back for blocks three and four. PMCIT will be here for blocks one and two, and then go to PMCIT. Their ability, just like now, to take electives is somewhat limited because of CIT. CIT is like their elective. They'll have to take their history, their math, their science, and their English while they're here. However, if they keep up on that, there is an opportunity, I believe, senior year, for some opportunity for electives there. So even, even currently, like I, I have a son who is taking a general science class when he really needed to take an advanced science class, but it wasn't available due to that. That's what I mean. Is that now going to be available to that type of student, or is it still going to be just as limited? One thing that we, we talked about, too, is that they can take their fourth math and science credit at CIT, which would free up space here for another credit in their school day. So. As you talked about, your student want to take an advanced science class. Being able to take credits down at CIT and satisfying credits there will open up space here for him now to take that advanced science class. Do you want to jump straight into Just, 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 just for the, because we don't have the double period right. of science anymore, it would be a greater opportunity for people right. to take higher level science classes. Right. That's yep. So, so the the ability for a CIT student to be here, AM or PM, for two whole blocks. Is going to free up more space for them to fit things in like you're talking about because you're right that does sometimes happen now um, and that's one of the awesome benefits of this it's going to make it easier it's not going to be perfect but it's going to be better than it is now as far as fitting in the classes that they're supposed to have or want to have yes yeah you just said about uh, the math and, and science at CIT 
So who's going to teach that? Yeah. Are you going to get out of my program carpentry? To, I got to let them go somewhere now? No, that's a good question. To be clear, uh, what what we meant was that every we believe every program in CIT emphasizes and inculcates those math and science standards. I've looked at them. I know you know that better than almost anybody. Um, so we feel that simply by completing their program, passing their program for that year, that that is good enough for us to say that they've met their math and science uh, credit. And I apologize, that wasn't yeah, entirely I'm clear. Like, I got a house to build. <laughs> yep. No, we understand. So we think that'll that'll really be a good trade-off. Their fourth credit. Their fourth credit right now. Yep. Yep. You mentioned director Ed being a class it's um, it's a club that you're inducted to right now. What you know exactly what the class entails, especially for current members? God, that's it. So the class, the character ed class, if you ask for clar clarification, the character education class, this does not replace the Knight's Order. Okay? The officers and the members of the Knight's Order is a different entity. The character education course, which will be most likely will be for every freshman, welcome to the high school. We'll be building on the characteristics and the pillars of character ed, which you can see right there and over there in that banner. Okay, each of these character ed courses will serve a lot of purposes. One will be to get our freshmen knowledgeable about our character education program. Two, to engage them in service learning. And three, it's going to be training amongst different members of the faculty. So one teacher is not just going to teach the character ed course. If those of you, uh, when I went to Moravian, we had an intro to college life course my freshman year. Kind of like, here's how we do things in college. There'll be some of that implemented into the character education course as well for freshmen. Again, one of the goals is to make our new freshmen feel welcome and part of the high school community here. Those freshmen that really take to character ed and want to do more, Sophia, that's where the Knights nice Order would come in and could possibly be recruited towards the night's order. So it's not a replacement for that. There's more in the back, yep. So you said multiple times that during the block there's going to be an opportunity for remediation for kids who need extra help. What about the kids that don't need remediation? What about the kids that are excelling at what they're doing and now you have potentially a poor student? Are they going to be able to excel in the class ahead of their other students? classmates or are they going to be at the pace of every single kid in their class because to me it doesn't seem fair that if you have an excellent student and you have a moderate student in the same class that they have to be the same pace no that's a great question so i'm sorry man were you finished yeah i, 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 I cut you off i apologize <laughs> so that's a great question so i mentioned a lot about remediation what about the student that doesn't need remediation that's the opportunity then in that same class period for enrichment. So while a teacher might be working with a student who needs remediation, we've already done professional development and training with teachers about what can you provide to teachers that understand the concept and now want to take it further. So while the teacher may be working with the students who need remediation, the other students will be working on going further with that topic, doing more with that topic. And then when the teacher's finished with remediation for the students who are getting back up to speed, then that teacher can move to that other group of students with the enrichment and go further with what they're talking about. We talk a lot about differentiated instruction and education these days, having different kind of avenues or paths for all the students in your class. That is difficult in a 43-minute period. In an 80-minute block, it affords teachers more opportunities. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a topic in world cultures that a few students wanted to go further with. And for sake of time or what have you, I couldn't. Block now allows me, once the lecture is over, that 10, 15 minutes, to split up that class, talk to students who need remediation, and then go further with students who demand enrichment. So all of that is going to be taking place in the block, which is why we are so stuck on this is not 80 minutes of lecture. This is much more an open arena it's a buffet, if you will, of what that student needs. I guess I just hope it doesn't turn into a buffet of the kids not either getting enough or not being engaged. You know what I mean? 
It's a, and that's, and that's, that, that is a concern that teachers have voiced as well. And that's why we started so early and done professional development and worked with them and are in classrooms going over that with them to ensure that does not happen. And obviously you guys must have some sort of plan in your plans to, if it doesn't work or something needs to be adjusted, you guys are going to do that. We've entered this with the idea that we may need to make tweaks as we go through this. We have to see it play out. Mr. Freeman, myself, uh, Ms. Krasukas, our new assistant principal, who starts February 6th, by the way, will be in and out of classrooms constantly, seeing what's going on, getting feedback, getting feedback from the faculty, seeing what's working, and if tweaks have to happen, that's when we'll make them. Are they going to get feedback from the kids, too, to see what they're thinking about it? Any, any, any faculty member right now in this high school, ma'am, that is not actively seeking feedback from their students, they need to take a look in the mirror and self-reflect because we are here to serve our students, serve their needs, see what, the, see what they want, see how they learn best and adapt to that. Every faculty member here takes their students into account and takes the student feedback into account. And that's what we demand of our faculty here at the high school living. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's an excellent point. I just know that the kids are probably not apt, especially coming in as freshmen, mm -hmm. they're probably not apt to say, hey, I don't think this is working. Or, or can you do something else for us? Because they're going to be in a, you know, it's new. It's oh, yeah. Like, it's like they're nerves. They're this, you know, they're the freshmen. So I would say I'm sure it's going to be across the board a little uncomfortable for everyone. But obviously, to grow, you have to feel comfortable. So hopefully, the growth will be good for everyone. And our, and Mr. Freeman has something to add that I'll say though, that the faculty here is humble enough to know that they're learning as, as well as their students. It's kind of we're all going through together. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities there for that, those conversations to happen, fostered by the teachers, because I agree with you. It's not, you know, it's not second nature for a new student to come in here and start offering critiques. There's going to be safe spaces for that to happen. Teacher encouraged. Mr. Freeman wanted to add something. Yeah, just, just to elaborate a little bit too, as far as receiving feedback from uh, students in particular, uh, Mr. Garrenser has done a great thing and set up a student advisory council uh, where, in fact, last week I was able to go to, to the meeting and uh, we, we discussed block scheduling with student representatives from every grade, and it was awesome. Uh, I, could, you know, I yeah, think you'd agree, Mr. Garrison, that um, that was a great way to get feedback from students in addition to teachers soliciting it on their, on their own. And then as far as other ways teachers would get feedback, Mr. Garrison and myself are in classrooms weekly, uh, many times. And so we're always either doing walkthroughs, formal observations, or simply just passing through in the halls and teachers are getting the feedback uh, very consistently. Is it? Um, in the past, we've had um, accessibility to the library during study halls or activity periods. So when will we be able to use the library, considering you don't want as much transitioning, as much like time in the hallways and such. So when are we going to be able to use that? Good question about the library. Libraries used a lot during study halls. Study halls with block, do not exist, all right, because we're in classes now. That's not being a library to be boarded up and you walk by, all right? First of all, green and white block is an opportunity for the library. Every green and white block, that's an opportunity for students to go to the library. Also, the number of teachers I've heard tell me now, my goodness, with 80 minutes, I can finally do this project in the library that I've always wanted to do. You can expect more research intensive classes in the library pretty much across the board. Now a lot of teachers are going to utilize that with this expanded time to use all the resources that we have at our fingertips to the most of their abilities. It's a great question, Lisa. Thank you for asking. So, yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned briefly about the dual enrollment. So are the seniors only going to have access to the dual enrollment in the second half of the year? No, they'll have spaces. They'll have spaces throughout their senior year, fall and spring semester. So basically, a senior has all their credits will have three open spaces. If
that senior wants to take three dual enrollment courses and it fits, and it's with a school that we have a memorandum of understanding with, they can do that. And that would be my path. I can tell you right now, in the Garrison household, block excuse will not have been allowed. Even as an 18-year-old, my mom would have said no, we'll do it. But the dual enrollment course is knocking three college courses out of the way. It's a big benefit, and it's, and, and it's justified for a senior that has done everything that they needed to do to get to that point. Yes, ma'am. So if I have a senior student next year, this is big changes for him. He's supposed to get another math class and he's already in the higher math level now. Um, since they have opportunity for all these extra electives, are seniors going to get the first dibs to make sure that they get what they want since they're going to miss out on all this opportunity? That's always the way it's, it's been done. Seniors generally get the preference over all those classes, particularly new ones that fit in their schedule. So if they want to take advantage of new math classes, they'll get preference over it because we know that they also, that they're going to have the least amount of credits in this grandfather system. They'll have to do another math class. Not, if he has, if he has, depending on the credits that he has so far, if he wants to take an extra math that we're offering, they'll have preference to do that. Okay. And then for the kids that are going to be in AP classes, you said some of them will be a three quarter AP, which will help with the exam, but the ones that are not prepared, are you going to have some kind of pressure or something to help them with the test? So the, the spring semester, so most APs will be market period one, two, and three. That leaves about a month between the end of the class and the AP exam. That month will be filled with, you know, during green and white block, refreshers, um, study, review time, if you're doing any AP class now. For the, there are two APs we're looking at right now as being only two marking periods or a semester. Those would be in marking period three and four. The reason being, the end of our school year is generally the fourth week in May. The AP exams are the end of the first or the second week. So the AP exams that are only a semester will be January basically to the beginning of May. I have time for review before the exams get started. And again, Mr. Freeman is correct. I know no other school district that does it that way. We're fortunate that we're able to do it that way here for those students that want to take AP. So when they do a three mark, uh, the three block for the AP classes, the last quarter of the year is just an elective? Or? We fill it with an elective or another class that they would want. But we have enough electives now that they can book in now with their three marking periods of AP. Because <coughs> nothing, nothing would be more detrimental than to have a student finish their AP in January and not take an exam until May. So we were dead set against that from the get-go. And we talked about teacher feedback. That's one of the things our AP teachers brought up to us. What about AP? And a lot of parents were concerned as well, rightfully so. What about AP? And that's our solution to that. And across the board, it's been met with resounding enthusiasm by our AP teachers as well. Very thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. So if you need remediation or you need enrichment, okay, that's where some choices will come into play. So let's say you're in band, chorus, and orchestra, and that's when you engage with that during green and white block. The beauty now of Google Classroom and virtual is that you're not going to miss any new learning during that block return. However, it's, if it's something you still want to engage with after your supplemental, maybe later in the evening, that will still be present in your Google Classroom for you to work with after that time. Yeah, it's not as if I take band and course, now I can't do this or do that. It's going to be added on top of that as well. If that's something that you want to engage with after you're done with your supplemental, you still can do that. Yes? A good question. So AP test review is during green and white block a lot of it during that month between the end of the third marking period and the AP exam. So what do I do? Green and white block is not concrete. So if you're a band corps for orchestra or a class officer, there may be times when you're going to say, I'm not going to come to band corps or orchestra, I'm going to go to my AP review. 
And all the faculty members know that, understand that, and know that's a possibility. Again, it's the choice that's best for you. Some AP students say, I don't, I don't need review. I have my review booklet, I have my quizlets, I'm good. Again, it's autonomy for the student in that regard. Any other questions? So again, registration is going to take place in the next few months. As questions roll in, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, please feel free to email me. Email our guidance department, email me, and we are talking about this every day, all day. All right, so we want your questions, and we want to be able to solve them. So if something comes up, the minute you walk out of here, I'm sure one will pop in your head, please send me an email or give me a phone call. I'm available 24-7. Yes, ma'am? You said that one of the days you're going to have each grade come in here and like make our own schedule. Are we going to be able to make our schedule with our parents? So the goal is one day the entire school will watch a video probably after and after where myself and Mr. Freeman go over all the new classes and all the changes. There will then be a time, maybe a week, week and a half, where you can discuss changes with your teachers and with your parents. So when you come into the registration period, you have a good mindset of what you want. You're not going to have five minutes go and pick and choose, and then in August change everything. That's what, exactly what we're trying to avoid. We want you as comfortable and ready to go for registration as possible. So we're going to give you the time to do that, and the time to talk with your parents, and the time to talk with your teachers. Hey, I'm thinking about this class. What do you think? Well, it's time for those conversations to take place. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you for all your attention. And if you have questions, please contact us. Have a great evening. It's a pleasure, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.